Good evening and welcome to season six, episode three of Inside the Rookery. I am joined today by my fellow Rooks, Andy Law and Mark Gibbons, and we are delighted to welcome back Gav Thorpe, writer, developer, Hello. games consultant. Me. Hello, New York Times bestselling author and 2017 David Gemmell Legend Award winner. Um, and <laughs> alumnus of Inside the Rookery, if you want to check out his previous stream, it was all the way back in season two, episode six. He has a Patreon, which is down there. Please check that out. And welcome to the stream, Gav, again. Thank you. Lovely to be here again. Looking forward Excellent. to it. Good. Um, so tonight we're talking about how to build an awesome war game. As always, our Patreon, our patrons, um, yeah, it sounded like I was saying we, uh, we always talk about how to build a way. <laughs> As always. Our patrons and Discord community have submitted questions on this week's topic. And as always as well, if something catches my eye, I will bring it up on stream from the comments. For example, Bastian loves opinions, got to get me some of them. Well, that is good because there will be plenty of them in this chat tonight. <laughs> it's the one thing we have in abundance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to jump right into it. Oh, we've spelt Kilishandra's name wrong. Apologies, Kilishandra. We'll add the R in. Um, what do you feel makes for an awesome war game? So are we starting with me, are we? Is that the always. Plan? Right. The guest See you guys in an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I've honed this down to a very short answer. Uh, no. Uh, what I've decided, what I've realised over the years that I find most important in an awesome war game, which is the same for almost any game really, but actually what makes us remember a game is, the, is the story that it creates. Um, the mechanics may come and go, um, things you know, like different armies may change and stuff, but actually the incident that we're talking about 20 years later in the pub to the, that we want, the war story that we have, the the, the narrative that it created in any given time between yourself and the other players or your opponent um, is what makes a game great, makes it awesome. Um, and so an awesome war game is the one that facilitates the most of those. So the most chance for creating memorable moments, amazing stories, for me, is what makes an awesome war game because, you know, uh, your dice might fail you, your tactics might fail you and stuff, but if you get a good story out of it, then it's not a total loss. So, damn it. The... <laughs> I'm saying damn it because um, memorable moments was exactly what I was thinking <laughs> on when I was mulling through what I was going to say for this point because um, for me as I look back on my many 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 different war games that I've played over the far too many years uh, the ones that have stood out and the highlights have always been those unlikely moments those tales that have spun out of the interesting rules or the armies that have been pitched together or exactly how this table has mm -hmm. spun up something unexpected and we've got something that we can talk about 5, 10, 15 years later do you remember that time when um, and ultimately uh, or almost all of our gaming experiences whether it's war games, role playing games, board games it's those moments that stand out and pick out in our memories that really make them worthwhile so as a designer ultimately you're looking for one thing Thing, what's going to make it stick what's the most likely thing to make that stick and as gav says narrative is a very strong a component towards that because we are after all story making machines we just love stories we can't help ourselves i mean look at the number of books we all have on our shelves so yeah basically ditto yeah so uh, the example i always use is on the opposite do you remember red dwarf and rimmer's risk diary his accounts of like it, and then I rolled a six and a five. Ah, but then he rolled a four and a two. And that's like the opposite of story and <laughs> gaming. It's just like it's ending up with Rimmer's diary, basically. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Some of my um uh yeah re my most memorable uh, uh war, war game moments have, have more often than not been humiliating defeats, but they still <laughs> stick with you. You know what I mean? I, I can blame my poor my poor tactical play or terrible rule imbalance, but you know either way, what what, what I remember and what I was remembering about this. Last night, thinking about you know today's chat was oh yeah that was that that end of the first round where that guy his drop pods came right down in the middle of my army and it was all over by the start of turn two. Like, <laughs> why, why does that stick with me? What you know? It's it's usually the disasters, isn't it? Yeah, usually. I have yeah. I yeah, mean, the, the one my favorite is a 
uh, it was the first Star of Warhammer tournament, and my 325 point Demon Slayer getting killed by a, a 60 point, no, 30 point Squig Hopper. So, uh, <laughs> just like Squig Hopper landed right on his head, the Squig did two wounds, and then my opponent, which was Gordon, um, went, Oh, he's got the club, the guy with the club, who was like, Doink, and just finished him off. And it was just like, Well, that's that then, isn't it? So but it's hello. <laughs> we laughed later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I imagine you did, or cursed at the time. Uh, at the time, my, I was not my, so pleased, but, yeah. my method of choosing an army was often the points value on the basis that the armies that had you know bigger points value per mini, I had to paint fewer minis. Um, and and so the dark elves, elves were always my um, chosen <laughs> or some elf variant, but but you do then luck does have a bigger <laughs> impact on you if you have much few, many fewer models in terms of the dice rolls. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh. Sorry, I've just seen one of the comments here, which is brilliant, which is about somebody playing Necromunda and rolling a hive quake and both the gangs running off from casualty straight away before they'd even started. That's kind of like... <laughs> oh, that, exactly, you, you know. At least you can start again. That's the other thing. Is like, <laughs> if, if it happens in the first turn, you know, it's when it happens on the like the round about the middle, and the, uh, yeah. Uh, particularly yes. with um, uh, particularly with the larger miniature games where you've done all your setup, you've got everything <laughs> organised. You've three hours in, and you're like, yes, and then suddenly the Absolutely. whole thing just collapses like a house of badly constructed yeah, I, I, cards. Yes, I, I was gonna f sorry. Yeah, sorry. Carry on. Yeah. I was just going to say Roderick's follow up to the to the um, hive quake. So we took the ones that had fallen and set up the zombie survival scenario from White uh, Dwarf. We teamed up to escape until the last minute when the spiders betrayed me and left my leader to die. Yes. I'll, um, I'll add one other thing on what makes things memorable. Um, I've played so many war games where it's effectively a fixed scenario or there's very little in the way of um, player interactivity in terms of how the forces are organized. And they tend to be quite fun because they're balanced and they're interesting games. But often the most memorable ones are when players have chosen something truly stupid um, or have <laughs> alternatively chosen to do something really big like back back when I was tiny and I ran my own Warhammer club. We had um, an entire scout floor filled with approximately 200,000 points worth of troops. And that was a truly memorable experience for, I think, obvious reasons. And um, Compare that entirely with when we're setting up for the first Warhammer tournament and organizing the actual champion, because we basically prepped him to win. Um, and we had a whole bunch of different people coming in and trying out different armies. But one of them made the worst army known to man, but was convinced it was the best. And just watching it play was the it was just a source of complete hilarity who makes units of just five in long lines and a, a, across the, just stupid <laughs> but it was hilarious because of all of the options that were available in the game so um sometimes all that variety can bring a unique and unexpected outcome that again creates those memorable moments so yeah and Bastian, welcome back. We've missed you in the chat, so it's great to um, see a question popping in from you. So Bastian says, Hiya, is it more frustrating or amusing when someone finds an exploit in the rules? I'm thinking mostly of that lad who'd line his troops up so no one could field theirs in 40k. Yes, until he got his comeuppance. Yeah, he did. Um, it was the, great. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, in, until he stone met paper. Um, uh, no, it's not. It's not, it's not frustrating. I suppose it's kind of amusing. It's just inevitable. There's so many more of them than us, and they have so much more time to break a system than we do. If you're designing mm. a game, you know, if you're ever going to release it and commit to publishing at some point, you know, it's like you could have had five years to work on a game, but then it's out there for ten. You know, and you know, it's like, oh, we had a hundred people on the playtest list. Well, well done. There's now ten thousand people have played it. Whatever. So. There's massive exploits like that one, which I think you know. Uh, but the thing is, it's, it's like anything. It seems obvious once it's, once one person's figured it out. But until one person's figured it out, it's just not obvious, you know. Um, so uh, th things like that, I think you know, they happen, and, and you can sort of react and kind of adjust to them. Um, for me, what I like to see is like if there are like exploits or if there's stuff that I, I'd like them to be at least be characterful. So if I'm designing an army or something like that, like I say, they'll at least play towards the strengths and the character of an army rather than against it. So if it was like 
at orcs, for example, if the if the most spammiest, most exploited of, of orcs was having lots of them, then I think that's a good, you know, it's like, oh no, what a shame, people are getting all kinds of lots of orcs in. Whereas, of course, it used to be like, actually, like, second edition, for instance, used to be all about big guns and, and you know, killer cans and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, there will be something to exploit. So, you know, trying to hopefully make it, uh, as we say, memorable, fun exploit, but you're not going to avoid it. It's just a, so you just have to sort of like, smile and go yeah well done well done well it's like the the, uh, the the sort of classic line of sight true line of sight exploits where the, where the army the, the model of, models all his miniatures lying down and they're, yes they're crawling across the battlefield uh, the entire time <laughs> i had a line of sight exploit for my dark elf army because you could get a familiar which counted as line of sight for Absolutely. casting spells which meant she could be in a unit but casting spells into other combat whereas usually you wouldn't be able to cast in or out of yeah. combat and and andy didn't like that exploit but they did no, but no, the design the exploit, it's not for an end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 it was a good one that was yeah. a feature not a bug it was a good see. Mm. yeah yeah it, <laughs> he was like i was yeah. like i think i can do this he was like i, yeah, I you don't know oh, you can damn <laughs> you it can, you can. <laughs> yeah. yes i think there's things where you just like uh, there's somewhere you might just end up slapping your forehead and just going, "Yeah, how did you, how did we not get that? How did we realise that? How did we not realise that was going to be a thing um, straight away?" Um, and they're the annoying ones, I think. Um, and, and and in no way, again, we'll get into this. You know, there's different types of gaming and different ways of playing games and different situations where, you know, like if I'm playing my friend's house and they rock up and they use that exploit against me, you're like, ha, ha, "Yeah, you're not coming back. You're not like let's just set up again. Let's play properly, shall we now?" Um, whereas it's like, yeah, if it's a pickup game at a club or a tournament or something, then you've got a different situation. So again, we have to, we have to sort of like moderate what we think of as exploits and where they get used and stuff. But actually, you know, um, um, so and, and for some I, people, there, you know, there's a line of like, what's an exploit and what's just being smart. You know, that's obviously mm -hmm. like a, an, in, an unintended consequence, but some are, are intended. You know. A brief interlude for Dwarf Love. Not about rules, says the cartographer Elysium, but I have to say I was not a fan of dwarves until I read Gav's dwarf books. They broke my heart, but I have a whole dwarf army now. I just want to say it's your fault. And Good. part part of the reason I brought this up on screen is because I was saying to Andy before the stream, I really want to show Gav my dictionary of dwarf runes my character is compiling from things nice. I encounter in game. So. Brilliant. Absolutely. <laughs> Very dear to me, the dwarfs. Yeah. So. Um, who has a better win percentage, Lindsay or Andy? Well, actually me, because I've played far fewer games and I've played uh. against other people other than Andy. And luckily that Dark Elf <laughs> army was the period of time I was playing Warhammer the most. And oh my God, it exploited everything it could exploit and kicked the ass of everything I went against. But Andy is amazing at war games. If you don't, don't play him. That's all I can say. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, right, yeah. let's get on to one. So Seagoat says, war games and board games have some overlap. Should we care about the differences when we create new games or should we concentrate on the mechanics and aesthetics of the game first? Come on, somebody else can start that one. Oh. <laughs> Andy, Andy, you look... <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll start. I don't think we should. Yeah, you go. Years, whether it's a war game or a board game or whatever, you, you're just creating a game you like. Like, why would I fuss about whether my game, other than you know, like marketing, why would I fuss about whether it was a war game or a board game or some mix of both? Just, so, I really care. Um, I mean, I, I, the, the should we concentrate on mechanics and the aesthetics of the game first? I mean, you should definitely concentrate on the mechanics and the aesthetics of the game, but it does admittedly depend upon what you're attempting to construct as an end goal. Are you going for something that's just uh, an effort to push pretty miniatures around a board, which quite a lot of some of the same, I'm not going to say the cool mini or not games are like that because some of them are really nice, but some of them have just got this, this massive expanse of enormously cool models that are really just... They're really just tokens in some respects. That's all they're really being used for. It's not about the models. It's not even about them interacting or creating stories. It's just about having a reason for having 2,000 models that they can pop up for their next Kickstarter. Um, and whilst the games might be really good, the models are not a necessary component of that. And if you are looking for something that is, say, for example, a miniatures battle game, I always feel a little bit like I've been 
hard done by with those ones, although I still buy them like the idiot that I am. Um, but I see no reason why you can't do all of the above and happily create according to the needs of the particular project at hand. I, I'm i not quite clear where I want to even go with the question. That was a bit of a non-answer. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, the, the, what, what defines a, a war game or a board game, other yeah. than obviously a board game presumably has a board. A lot of war games have, have boards too. It's interesting well, what you said about, you the, about the, so. the, the cool You think that but originally the board comes from the fact they were played on a table. Not with an it, yeah. board. An epitaph. Table. Yeah. Mm. yeah, table oh, games. Well, Oh, well, well, I think that, that would actually that, that, that's what we should call them all in future and clear up all the confusion. Yeah, well, we do have that. We, we do talk about tabletop games now, don't we? That's the yeah, thing, just yeah. as, as a hobby, now, as a broader thing, because you know we all play card games, we all play role playing games, we all, you know, it's like if you're a gamer, something to differentiate between them and video games. Basically, it's like physical yes. games, yeah, and that's yeah. um, so tabletop games. And I think, yeah, oh, sorry, uh, the. The line between a miniature and a well-crafted playing piece again is just very blurred. I think you, Mark, was just about to say something about that. Yeah, on that, on that, on that point, it just occurred to me now that the of the the, the the sort of the big boxed miniature games of which, like Andy, like all of us, we, we ended up buying too many of them and jumped on the Kickstarters. I just, I've, it's just occurred to me that I never, I don't feel under any uh, obligation to paint the miniatures in those boxes, but I feel massively obligated to paint the miniatures yeah. I buy for, you know. But war games. Yeah. I feel I feel bad. I feel guilty for not painting those. But the big box uh, ones, am I getting? I, no, I. I, I oh, absolutely. I, having you know, like having a, literally half my loft is full full of Cthulhu wars, um, and and things <laughs> like that. You know, um, and I find. I, I find myself in a minority when I have this discussion as well because again, I love big models and 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 lots of plastic and stuff, um, and but actually. There's a part of me which, if it's a board game, would much rather have lovely painted standees as part of the aesthetic as well, rather than a sea of grey plastic. Yeah. If you've got these lovely yeah. like, detailed dungeon setups and or whatever it might, you know, or all, all the rest of the components. And again, you know, having worked with lots of amazing sculptors and lots of these amazing models in their own right and things, and, and would um, would you know grace any kind of table. But actually, as an overall spectacle, suddenly you go actually there's a bunch of grey miniatures. Um, but that's just not the, that's not the trend anymore. That's not perceived as a value of having lots of lovely. You know, I think of it like the, the the original talisman uh, mm. and the million and one cards um, of characters and stuff we ended up with. And then when Games Workshop changed over talisman to having miniatures, it, re it massively restricted the number of characters you could have because they were left to have a miniature. Yeah. So again, yeah. it's like well, yeah. we lost something in going 3D. And again, you know, just within that one game system. Um, obviously, these days. It's slightly different in terms of like, yeah, you can have like a hundred. Uh, I mean, I've just I've just started playing the Deep Rock Galactic board game, which again is like lovely, beautiful production stuff, and the models are nice and chunky of the space dwarfs and stuff like that. But they are grey, so I, and uh, there's only a few of them, so I do start thinking, oh, maybe I should paint them to go in with the rests, but I won't. I know I won't. I've got I've already got too many of like for miniatures, you know, for other armies and stuff. So yeah, my uh, favorite. It's... <laughs> I was just going to say my favourite Blood Bowl team was one that Andy made up that was standees rather than... I mean, like, I've had loads of Blood Bowl, but it was for Midden Ball, so it was, like, humans, just wizards. And and he made my team, and then every week he would, like, just draw... Well, I mean, I suppose Andy could do that because he can just draw stuff in a week. But, yeah. <laughs> but I really like a standee because of that, because of the variety and, and how tailored it can be, whereas minis, I yeah... Minis have their place, but a standee is a, a good alternative. So, so I love adore people. miniatures. Just, just, just adore them. They pretty much <laughs> pull me back to my childhood. Um, having said that, though, in terms of my recent wargaming and the games that I've enjoyed the most, they've sort of fallen into two loose categories. Category number one are board war games that are fixed scenarios, Martin Wallace esque style games that I've really got to grips with trying to figure out how to win that individual game. For those of you who know your uh, older games from Games Workshop, we're talking more the Battle for Armageddon style game or the original Horus Heresy style game. Classic war games respun in different ways. Or alternatively, on the other side, um, I, as for all I love miniatures, I just don't anymore because, well, I'm going blind, which is always a good start. Um, but beyond that, um, there's games like X-Wing. And X-Wing is a really good game. 
and everything's painted and every time you pull it out because it comes you buy it painted every time you pull it out it looks fucking amazeballs and if you want to make it look better you can because you can take one of their little models spruce it up a little bit make it look a little bit different if you fancy doing so and end up with a very unique individual uh, group of ships and that also uh, leans into the hobby side but yeah i i sort of agree that i really like something that looks like a spectacle i can't help it and thus mm -hmm. Um, my big seas of grey plastic are pretty much sidelined these days. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, smiling um, Tom has got. Oh, sorry, Gav, when you go. So, I was just going to say the, the one other thing coming actually, which is at the start, which is like if you're de thinking of designing a game, then actually, the more although it doesn't feel like it these days because we have so many like cards and counters and stuff in our war games. Actually, because um, I in my own designs and stuff, I want to strip stuff back. Is is that do you have a board actually because a set of war games rules can be just a book and that's a lot easier to produce mm -hmm. it's like you, you know you assume people have dice you don't have to do a box set so actually if you want to do if you want to start out designing games a, a miniatures tabletop game is a good way to do it because you don't have to worry about anything other than just like having a book a pdf out there um, and, and cut your teeth doing that rather than like like say hey i'm going to be cool me i'm not out the door you know no you're not <laughs> but what you can do is call, invent your cool little skirmish rules or whatever it is. Scratch your itch first, you know. So that's a, and, and that really does determine what you can do then, because you know you go, you've got a book. You don't, you know, maybe a few counters, but that's it really. And then your design leap comes from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So smiling Tom asks, can you recommend a couple of war games that do not endure power creep at ta tactical and at strategic level if possible? Um. So my so the, my answer was yes, loads, but it depends on the type <laughs> of war game you like to play, because there's loads of games that you you know uh, that are campaign based, narrative based, much more. Um, you know, Osprey do a whole bunch of war games. You just pick one of theirs. You know, most of those because again, they don't actually exist with a meta game. There isn't a new release. That's the thing that changes mm -hmm. that creates power creep is a new army, a new team, a new thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that inevitable meta game that kind of comes with change whereas actually if you just want to take or you know you, you get a copy of dragon rampant or lion rampant or uh you know some of the you know burrows and badgers whatever you know war games rules you want mass various mass battle rules even that aren't tied to a continuous miniatures release then you won't get power creep you won't get anything new um or you will have a very different experience because these are more narrative you know these are more like you know as I say, they might have new stuff come out, but they're much more uh, narrative. Uh, you know, if I could recommend my own games, uh, you know, the 2000 AD games we did with Warlord, again, there's no supplements, no tail. It's a self-contained. It's a game, not a game system, although there's a game system within it. So it's like if you play Strontium Dog, there's nothing coming down the line that's going to change the the meta of Strontium Dog. The game that you get is the game that you get. So I, I would say, I would think, in my experience, the majority of games are like that, but actually... A few of the big ones, which are, have this particular release schedule and uh, you know commercial structure to them, will inevitably have some of that power creep just because new releases, uh, and not even like in a in a cynical kind of business way, but just you add stuff to the game, you have to find a way to make this new, this different, interesting. When you get onto the twentieth thing that you have to invent for that game, and you're starting to reach, and I'm not you know just reach for more interesting things, they're going to be break. Essentially, you can you can summarize games design as two stages, which is games design, which is great, where you you build this beautiful purring engine, and then games development, which is cram stuff into it for ten years and screw it up until we get to do a new edition, and then create another beautiful purring engine. It would, you know, that's my experience anyway. And as much as you die, my lovingly try and put those bits into the thing, it's like you still end up bolting <laughs> stuff onto that purring engine that wasn't intended at some point. You do, know. do you think there was a version of, of 40k, for example, that, that actually nailed it and worked up to it and said, right, no, yeah, no more additions. This is it. <laughs> oh, well, I, the, the, I would say uh, there was. Uh, the, the consensus, I would say, and this is not just me saying it, but when I talk about people, is actually when we did when we launched third edition, and we had army, there was the army list in the rulebook itself, that, and they were all created all at the same time. And of course, they didn't have mm -hmm. some of the craziest stuff out there, which is also obviously what breaks the rules as well. But they covered pretty much most of people's armies. You know, they were the get you buy list, the equivalent of the second edition Black Codex mm -hmm. type thing. Uh, that I think was the most balanced version of 40k. 
I wouldn't say necessarily the best, because best is just subjective. Right. But in terms of those armies, yeah. were all tested against each other, against those sets of missions. You know, and if and if something was going to be encased in amber, uh, funnily enough, I'd take most of those army lists, but actually use some of the fourth edition rules tweaks. But apart from that, um, that mm. was you know that was the most complete 40k was I think because it didn't have you know all the codexes adding bits in and new troop types and different stuff like that. So and it was all uh, that was the level playing field because we had that clean slate, which has never really existed again. There's always some kind of legacy of the miniatures, the army lists, whatever it might be. Um, and I would say sixth edition Warhammer was essentially the same position again because there was such a clean slate. And I wouldn't say you know and and I wouldn't say the I wouldn't say the get you by army list on that were quite as good as the 40k ones, but actually the first tranche of army books that we did for sixth edition again, because it was just under control and they all kind of developed at the same time. And then, but then you get later on, you start just you know adding in the, the armies become more extreme and just because of the character of those armies or, or, or just because you're trying to make them different to what you've come before. Um, but yeah. It's a what, I, what I found particularly fascinating about that is that's pretty much exactly what I would have said. Um, I was thinking through it, and I'm all because I played all the editions of all the games, and for 40k, where I found it running at the smoothest and the cleanest, and with the less, with the least potential issues, because the next army really did have a not a, a game breaking thing, but a thing that just made you go really um, was about third 40k and about six. There's bits I'd want to pull from all over the place with Warhammer, though, because uh, it went so through so many different iterations. But yeah, about third, yeah, about yeah. the same time, really. Yeah. yeah. Mark, yeah. Did, did you were you just asking Gab, or did you have an opinion yourself on your? No, own? I have no idea. I just saw the picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had the most so third edition had some of the most pictures in it as well. It's true. There you go. <laughs> so I must have um, made it the best. <laughs> Seagull asks, I, I, this question does confuse me because it really does question how we're defining war games if they did, wouldn't have opposing sides or factions. So war games are based on conflict, typically opposing sides or factions. Are you aware of any war games which do not revolve around this premise? Can you create a war game without this premise? Oh, and he's nodding there, so he's obviously yeah. got something to say. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I, I've been thinking about this, and quite a few games give this a bit of a stab. Um, Cold War games, for example, aren't actually about the war. They're about all the build-up and the potential for war, ranging from your Twilight struggles to almost everything else. So there's definitely been games that do it. Um, I suppose you could focus on the logistics, on the moving things around, on the threat, but... The majority of the games that I've played that are at heart war games are all about the, if not necessarily just the conflict, it's the build up and then resolution of the conflict. And I can't think of many games that I've played and enjoyed that have been all about the potential for conflict without actually doing it. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, how yeah, do you know who won? Sorry, yeah. Mark, when you go. I mean, you could say that there are plenty, obviously, plenty of games that are entirely. Uh, cooperative but then they're not are they mm. war games at that point because even if you've got even if the, the the rules control an opposition there's always an opposition that everybody's mm. lined up to, to 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 battle so i um yeah i guess yes of course there are games that are uh free of conflict um uh but they're not are they war games then i don't know um yeah i might what's the one that we we play andy i'm so bad at remembering names of things you've got the four chaos factions and then you've got the expansion that has oh, chaos, the in, the chaos, chaos in, in the old world chaos in the old world yeah so it's not it is a board game That's but, Eric but one. it does it also has minis and it's kind of war game-ish um, and i would say that that is an although there are different victory conditions for each of those chaos gods and you really you win through different ways so like zinch doesn't do direct fighting or tries not to and actually just fucks with everyone else's shit and tries to make other people fight each other and slanesh you know distracts people and and nurgle gets points by like i don't know i can't remember with populations big populations like killing folk actually yeah, With killing disease. folk, but not mm. but not fighting them. Just yeah. when if Nurgle's there, when that population, when that province collapses. So, like that was an interesting concept where they were trying to lean in to what was different. About it was a precursor to of many of the yeah, a precursor to many of the cool mini or not games um, by the same yeah. designer as well because it's effectively area control. 
and you're working yeah. through various area control mechanics, each of which have got a different flavor for how they're controlling that area, whether they're controlling it with their token and killing someone else with a die roll, or they're controlling it with their token because it's beside another token. But in the end, uh, sort of war game -ish. Yeah, like the Ragnarok one where you're all... Yeah. Again, same it's, designer. It's some area control. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's got some cute little mechanics that the first time you do them, like if you're if you get Loki cards and you're constantly aiming to lose, the first time you do it, you take people by surprise. But then it becomes a little bit, and I find chaos in the old world the same, like a little bit samey, like you're doing the same dance every time. You're constrained by the by the faction you're in rather than being freed by it. Bring up Kevin because he's yeah, he's largely right there. Side. <laughs> No, I disagree with that one. I don't think Scythe is a war game. Scythe is an engine builder game that happens to have some mechs in it. Um, yeah. yeah. I think. Because you, you absolutely can win it without anyone fighting anyone. But that's because that's the way it's designed. Indeed, Therefore, you often not, do. It is not a war game. It doesn't, it's not about... Because actually, yeah. I, I think, in the premise of the question, it's like, no, a war, if it's a war game, it's conflict because war is conflict. But there is such a thing as a miniatures game without war. Potentially, mm -hmm. I don't know if I've seen any. As I say, I thought about this before. And like, is there a game about like you know, like teddy bears trying to pick flowers fastest or whatever else it might be? Um, but I think it's again, it's like even even on the scale you're talking about, like say with, with chaos in the old world, the conflict is still the conflict between the chaos gods. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like yeah, it you can't is, all yeah. win. Like say, if you don't, and you can have cooperative games like Mark said, where you don't, you know, it's not about winning, but again. The conflict is then with the engine of the game itself, usually, and the timer or the whatever yeah, else. Yeah, like pandemic. Is, a, yeah, um, pandemic so, is a war against the disease, so it doesn't have actual war, and it but but it's still a conflict between two opposing sides, the game and you. Yeah, because essentially, you know, even if you even if you're playing something like um, you know uh, a solo game. Like I say, there's still again there's some kind of programmed opponent or random opponent or whatever that you're trying to to overcome, um, because I think a war game, <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose a war game without conflict and stuff is you just playing with your toy soldiers, making pew pew noises when you're painting them. Um, that's pretty I much think how, that's probably, I, how I play. Which is probably anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, find, yeah. <laughs> I think so. That, that, if you had a GM'd game. Potentially as well, that would run something maybe differently. Uh, that's where you can have like you know whoever make whoever make guns make the best noises. Oh, it's like, oh, that's a really cool laser noise. You need a really good armor noise to prevent it. Um, <laughs> aha, that beats your pew pew. Uh, nice. But uh, yeah, again, I, I think there's there's a necessity. Yeah, because conflict's such a broad word. You know? Really is. It doesn't does the game have to have war? No, not necessarily. I don't think it has to have war, like soldiers hitting each other and stuff like that. But conflict is a, the conflict is what is the mechanic. There is, if you don't need a, if there's no conflict, you don't need a mechanic to resolve anything. Yeah. Um, so Seagull has it said, if I want to try and design a war game without conflict, I'll try and combine Ticket to Ride with 40k. I think that might work. It's all about logistics. But to me, that's just a board game. You've just given, you've just reskinned Ticket to Ride with a, with a 40k. A 40k theme. Well, I, I've played Ticket to Ride, ride and I've been the guy that's wanted that freaking station, and you've taken it, and you're telling me there's no conflict in that. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I've jumped over the table and throttled people, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. I so mean, yeah, the fact that it's, yeah. again, war conflict, not the same word, you know, I think. Yeah. Uh, so without getting into you know, how many angels dance on the head of the pin, I think you need a conflict in the game. Mm. You don't need a war in a game, necessarily. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Do you know what? We went to, sorry, very brief aside about Hungry Hippos, which was like we were, uh, we one of our summer vac um, you know, excursions was to Skegness. And there's an, ad well, it's for kids, but adults can fit on it, life-size Hungry Hippos in one of the arcades there. So you can sit on and you nice. which was um, very funny. But I didn't play it, but you know, let's just say. It Good old Skeggy. Made. Good old Skeggy delivering. Um, <laughs> so Hungry Hippos this wasn't intended. a hippo with a machine gun is just. <laughs> This wasn't intended to be a 40k um, stream, but Cartographer Elysium has put a comment, uh, a question in the chat, and I did say I would bring things up from the chat. So, in the Warhammer 40k timeline, what is something that hasn't been explored much that you would want to write about or feature in some way, like the Unification Wars, Old Night, etc.? Or would you just rather move on from that and write other things? <laughs> That's, yeah. I, I, I mean, the, 
the 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 chance of any of that happening at the moment not just me but you know um 40k is very much uh, from a publisher point of view is in two spaces which is the heresy stuff which is just coming to an end and the present day which is the indomitus crusade um there isn't uh internally i don't think there's much appetite at the moment for like um you know, because the one that often comes up is the um uh, Age of Apostasy, you know, the Reign of Blood, Gay Grand Dyer, the, the Birth of Sister Battle stuff, which I'd love to do. Loads of religious nonsense, madness going on, and all that kind of stuff. But I just don't see it happening soon. Um, or you know, for and there's various other things. Cool, cool little. The timeline's full of cool stuff. That's the whole point of the timeline. It's there to inspire ideas and people to make up stuff. And in some ways, that's for the best. Just to leave it as those as those things of you know the. Uh, what was it the Nova Terra Interregnum or, or whatever it is? It's like, oh, that sounds really cool. Good. <laughs> now it seems really on. cool. You yeah. know, it's the like Space Marines, Space Marines again. Great. Go ahead and do that. The, you know, the Fourth Quadrant Rebellion. You know, the the whole kind of like um, Badab and Tyrant of Badab and stuff like that. Again, is really cool. It's been explored a little bit. You know, it's had some fiction and things. But that's probably about enough you need. You don't have to go into it any more than we've done already. So uh, there's areas that would be nice to, but I I don't. I've not. I don't spend lots of time thinking about that sort of stuff. I, I direct them more towards things that are likely to get published um, and pitch pitch for those things instead. Um, so, smiling Thomas, is there any period <laughs> slash theme slash conflict that you would think you think would make for a fun war game? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we've lost Andy. Yeah, you have. <laughs> the answer is clearly yes, all of them. And pretty much every single last yeah. one of them could be super cool and exciting. I'm such a child. I'll play the lot. Job done. Yeah, I mean, there's even, you know, there's even the Andertal War games and stuff like that. So, you know, Homo sapiens versus the Andertal or whatever is all still fun. You know, um, there's loads of making like war, war games as well. Just make it, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> That'd be quite cool. <laughs> Uh, Dino Wars, yeah. Well, is it? Yeah, is it dinosaurs with no human? It's not like humans evolved. It's just literally yeah, like yeah. T Rex versus dinosaurs yeah. riding just dinosaurs, dinosaurs, killing dinosaurs. Well, that's, just dinosaurs. Well, that's yeah. just lizard yeah. men, isn't it? <laughs> Shh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, said, I meant to add that hasn't been done thoroughly yet. So, like something you would like to do that hasn't been i'd like to see That's... just with the uh, um uh the 2000 ad ones i'd like to see a uh, flash then as a as a sort of asset management uh cowboys I... versus dinosaurs that'd be amazing oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah the flash would be great um uh yeah i mean there's there's yeah there's various ips i think which we make make some games so not all of them necessarily a lot of people go i oh, wouldn't be cool to have a thing set here and you think no because they don't really have very good wars in that ip it's not really about that mm. thing you know, you could have games set there, but not necessarily war games again. Um, but I think there's so many rules out there and things. I, I'm not necessarily aware of more. Um, so um, there's bound to be a rule set somewhere uh, for any particular yeah. period. Uh, themes differently. Like I say, I mean, funnily enough, I would like one of the things I think there is a bit of an opening for is... Um, like I say, miniatures games, not necessarily war games, but miniatures games, which are uh, a slightly younger audience. We've got quite a few other sort of board games come through and kind of great introductory games for like, you know, board gaming and card gaming and stuff like that. Um, but just uh, a nice... Um, gateway. Gateway game, yeah, you know. Hmm. Um, we've lost, you know, there's never been another Hero Quest. I find it amazing that Hero Quest, that was the gateway for so many people in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And then, of course, what is re released 40 years later as a you know, high, very niche, high spec, expensive, crowdfunded game for the yeah. exactly the same people. <laughs> got it the first time now. Yeah. From Hasbro, of all people, where you go, no, 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 the lesson of Hero Quest is to make another Hero Quest. Yep. And then get another yeah. entire generation into, like, you know. But anyway. I am consistently, and we are consistently surprised at the Rookery that Lego do not have a role playing game and mechanics for war games. Like, it, it's the obvious thing to do, and it it's a yeah, it's a, it's a yeah, it's a tricky one because Lego, uh, Lego, and Lego Foundation uh, have like an anti gun policy. So, they, but of course, that's kind of gone by now that they do like Star Wars and things like that. So they have no real guns. Um, so 
Um, but mm. I think, um, interestingly, yeah, I mean, there are like various like fan made Lego Wars sets and stuff like that out there. Yeah. But something that would be a bit different that was very Lego based and deliberately, yeah, based on that, I think would be cool. Very, um, a, a, it's a strong candidate for a fantasy version because uh, mm -hmm. there's a, a yes. much more leeway with big plastic swords than there is with uh, guns. Yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, they do, I mean, they did do a series of really cool little games. I don't know if they did. Know we own some of them. Which, yeah. yeah, which are really fun, actually. <laughs> They've got some nice cool little mechanics and stuff. And Star Wars ones and that. So, you know, there are so much, I suppose. But again, depends on what you call them. Uh, if you call them more games or not. Um, but yeah, the... Uh, but I, I think the big issue with those is that most of those were self-contained games that were built around that little box set that you bought yeah. in the world that it created, rather than being the Lego game that lets you oh, play yes. with yeah. your Lego pieces. So yeah, again, it's definitely between a yeah. game and a game system. Mm -hmm. I think you can, you know, there's lots of games, but generating a game system where you can just, you know, use whichever yeah, your Lego that's... models you want. You yeah, know, that's kind of what cool. I'm talking about. I get that it's so Mornington Crescent says with Lego, it's a very philosophical point. They don't want to pr promote conflict. But for me, it's more like a system of resolution that, that fits Lego's philosophy and and simplicity, I think would be amazing for young people. But there we go. And for me, too. I mean, I I've watched Lego. Ninjago. There's plenty of fighting in it. I mean, Ninjago is cool. And there's plenty of fighting in it. And it's Ninjago is a skirmish is. game. You know, it doesn't have to be chopping heads off and stuff, you yeah. know, it's like, or, um, or yeah. Bionicles, you know, again, people just like, you know, there's the, their, their, uh, their anti violent stance, which is great, doesn't like, isn't anti action. And so mm. an action game, an action yep. Lego minifigures game, um, would be cool. Um, um, I mean, you can, you can make it funny. Instead of people dying, they can just replace their bits with naked bits. Oh no! I've knocked his armor off. <laughs> I'm running away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. Or they just or they just put themselves back together again because they're Lego. So yeah, it's just totally. Like, they're Lego. Yeah, yeah. They'll be fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just like in the Lego like video games. You just like you fall apart and you just respawn exactly. back into. Um, right. So Kilishandra has asked, um, "What's your favorite contribution to the war gaming world?" And if you don't feel that you want to blow your own trumpet, then I'm going to ask Andy and Mark what their favorite contributions that you have made, Gav, are to the war gaming world. Oh, uh, well, I, I have to say, I mean, again, I don't like favorites and stuff. The, the project that I worked on that I'm most proud of is Inquisitor, which I say each time I'm asked this sort of thing. In terms of uh, the wargaming world. So that as a project and, and what it did and what it said about the 4K universe and, and narrative gaming and all that kind of, and the project itself to work with and just work, you know, it came together really nicely in terms of vision and all the rest of the stuff. So um, I wouldn't say that's my favourite, but it's the one I most fondly, well, well yeah, the, the one that I'm most proud that I was involved with. So it's mm -hmm. it, and it and its legacy to 40K it's still felt now, and I feel, I feel mm -hmm. pride in that. And lots, of, I mean, I invented lots. Of, you know, we've we all invented lots of stuff for forty k and, and stuff like that. But I think the the the, the themes that we established or re-established with Inquisitor sort of have carried through again into forty k, and were sort of like uh, at a particular time, sort of like um, bedded down ideas about forty k and its ethos and its themes that had you know needed restating at that time. I think. So, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> Good choice. <laughs> uh, for yeah. me, um, I, I particularly enjoyed it because it was um, Games Workshop had been producing largely the same thing for some time. And they were going around in circles more than necessarily building something new. And it was taking the established IPs adding a significant amount of depth to a small area and showing the narrative potential of the worlds that we're in that then turn into a, almost a cascade of novels, a cascade of additional support to army lists that beforehand were largely ignored or emptied and then suddenly came resurgent again a few years afterwards. It was, I think, a particularly influential piece. And yeah, yeah, good choice. So is was the question what is personally um, my contribution, or what do I think is the greatest contribution to the wargaming world? Oh, um, your favourite one that you did yourself? You have an anything. Anything. There's only one. Have I've only made. Yeah. I've only made one. I think. <laughs> 
I told I, I mentioned this in the podcast the, the other week, and it's um it's uh the squig hopper. Although I didn't create the squig hopper, I had a conversation with Rick uh, during I guess fourth edition development of fourth edition orcs and goblins, um, and he was concerned that the I've done I've done the artwork for the uh, the squig herders and the netters and goblin netters and stuff like that, and the subject of right uh, goblins riding squigs came up and. Um, <laughs> Uh, Rick thought it might be too silly, and I said, "No, don't be silly. It's not silly." So but there we go. That, that's that. I say yeah. that's, that's the crossroads. Nobody it's mentioned quite... space hoppers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. With teeth. Space hoppers with teeth. We don't know. That's not that's, silly. That's pretty much it. So it was just, just, just a, a, a nudge from from uh, my contribution. Um, uh, not that it wouldn't happen anyway. So what uh, you're saying is it's your fault my Demon Slayer died. Oh, in a roundabout <laughs> way, yes. I am oh. really disappointed you said that because I was about to say that too. I was like, ah, 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 ah. this all links. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, right, I, 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 yeah. I find it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, they're a good example, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, something that's funny in a game which would be is horrific in real life it's a real orcs and goblins type thing actually you go hey it's space hoppers mm. and goblins like i don't want to meet one of them actually i don't want i generally don't want to eat, meet a space hopper that's going to eat me can you imagine it's like oh look at it bouncing bounce, bounce. Ah! You know, <laughs> you know, especially when you get as big as yeah. the ones that are out there now the massive like you know ones that are chained together and you, you know like people love squigs don't they so oh yeah yeah, yeah. i i was in my late 20s when I found out that the space hopper was a kangaroo. What? I didn't know. What it was? Oh, this, the original space hopper, the face on it is a kangaroo. Oh, yes. Yeah. The, the, I did not know yeah, that. Yeah. Until, oh, until no, I didn't know when I was a kid. In my 20s. I didn't know at all. I didn't know that till, until right now. I didn't <laughs> know. Oh, I feel like I have. I, I feel like I've educated right you. Did you not know that? Really? Um, yeah, no. um, somebody else told me, and I was like, it can't be. It can't be. And I went and looked it up, and apparently, yeah, it's a kangaroo. Who'd have thought? Boing, 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 bright red. Boing. Yeah, I mean, because all kangaroos look like that with their big round bottoms. <laughs> I, th- I mean, how could I not tell? There you go. Yeah, there you go. Um, I had no um, idea. So Smiling Tom is asking for some um, modern recommendations. He says, some of the most enduring games I can think of combine board game and war game elements in perfect balance, like Space Hulk and Blood Bowl. Is there anything similar less than 30 years old? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Great question. Let's move on. Um, I'll yeah. make a, a brief comment and say that one of the reasons that I particularly loved both Space Hulk and Blood Bowl is that they combined some really simple, direct, clean game design. Maybe not first edition of Blood Bowl, let's be honest. Um, but the, the core elements were certainly there, but definitely the first edition of Space Hulk. Um, along with the thing that I particularly enjoyed as well, which was miniature collecting and painting, but it was all quite achievable. A small squad of five mm. Terminators, easy. A team of 11 to 16 chaps plus a few extra um, team members on the side, super easy again. Something that was well within even the most ADHD of mindsets. I could get there. Um, and that was good. Uh, so I particularly loved not just the games for the games themselves, which I'll admit I did adore, but I loved them for the uh, painting options that they provided when I was maybe playing Warhammer far more than I really should have been, but so so upset with my Warhammer armies in general for being half painted or not quite there. So they came mm-hmm. hand in hand with angst because I like things looking pretty. I just do. And it was much easier to get a completely pretty game with Space Hulk or Blood Bowl. So, a slightly different answer, because I'm politicianing my way through that one. I'll answer a different question and bow out. <laughs> um, there's commands and colours, which um, obviously mm-hmm. are, are actually used blocks and things like that, but actually there's variants of that, like the Memoir 44 games and and, and games of that ilk, which again these days quite often you know, have actually have plastic miniatures on stands or, or plastic miniatures moving from X to X and stuff like that. They're all of that, um, you know. Uh, Blood Bowl is an interesting one just because I think it stopped becoming a war game in third edition, really, when it when Jervis completely reinvented the system, kind of threw off the last of the two last two editions, came out with the blocking dice mechanic, which is still the best mechanic anyone's invented. Um, Brilliant. Um, which just like 
was perfect and made the game, and then it just became a board game. The fact that it was based on an IP yeah. of a war game is it was it was kind of like really left behind then. You know, especially compared to first edition Blood Bowl, second edition Blood Bowl. Um, uh, mm-hmm. You know, they were much more like oh, well, on this table, and you know, da, 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 and they they they'd grown out. You could see they'd grown out of war gaming and role play. Whereas like third edition Blood Bowl became the same thing. Space Hulk. I mean, I had the pleasure and the privilege of very briefly working with Hal. Um, when we were doing the Citadel Journal when he wrote some extra missions for Space Hulk. Um, and most of the work he did was actually with Ian Pickford, but I met Howard a couple of times. And and he did, he approached Space Hulk like it was chess. For him, you know, the difference between it being five five spaces to that room and four spaces to the room would be a matter of long thought and hard, you know, it's like of the number of APs and the consequence. So, so every mission he constructed in that first edition was was, you know, uh, wasn't just like oh, let's just put some more, you know. Uh, I don't want to say like more, but actually, yeah. I don't, more recent versions have been less rigorous, just because they have, because they've introduced yep. more things. The games developed; they've, they've had cooler stuff and things, but they haven't had that attitude to it. Funnily enough, one of the one of the one of the scenarios he introduced was with bolters that could fire around corners. Um, so there you go. So you're you still having fun with it, but that was um, uh, I don't know. I think it was like a mental legion thing or whatever they had. Um, <laughs> they had so, uh, but, but again, but that's because that, for him that that changed the the. The kind of dynamic of a scenario was like, oh, actually, if you introduce this mm-hmm. thing, I'll just tweak this one thing, and suddenly I've got, I've created a different game space for people to to explore it, and here's a mission that explores it. So, um, uh, but so yeah, there there are there are similar games, I think, with similar rigor to them um, in in the modern day. But again, it's hard to know until you've played them because uh, you know a a board with lots of cool miniatures on. Which has got a grid and all the rest of it, you know. Um, tends to, again, it's the sorry. Go back to space. Hulk. The cool thing about space Hulk, again was it that narrative, that just like that, you know, that sixth flame of shot or that time of Sergeant Wifty's parry or the, yes. you know, what, so again, really simple mechanics. But actually, what you ended up with it was that you know because because it had that fine tuning of just like oh oh no oh right and again even even in the first edition once you start getting to Deathwing and kind of like Gene the Cultists and all that kind of stuff it it was it become more of a war game with a board agreed um, so it's not I'm not just pointing fingers at later editions of Space Hulk like when you start now, but... buying your squad types yeah, yeah. exactly when and when the Gene Seeders can yeah. shoot back again that dynamic just changed yeah. completely changed everything game, yeah. you know so the cycles so and again it was just like so. There's a very there's a purity to Space Hulk and again third Agreed. edition Blood Bowl, I think, and the original Blood Bowl teams as well in third edition, uh, maybe with a few tweaks for the rules, but you know that that made them you know the classics that they are. Uh, yep. Yep, I agree completely. Um, I'll also just add my little uh, Command and Colors great game, um, and is definitely worth having a look at if you want to have uh, a relatively simple to set up and understand rule set that has a surprising amount of tactical flexibility in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and different yeah. periods. And, it's ancients, Napoleonics, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, sorry. And does that, does that in, in and of itself answer this question, Gavin Andy? Because does Command the Colours have miniatures, or is it? It does. Not for everything, but it's oh, very I'm blocky in places, but one. yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so the original commands and colours were just, yeah, were well, wooden blocks. Yeah, just wooden blocks. Um, but the later versions of the games um, and some of the other, you know, because it's, it's actually, they've had various different publishers who would actually had miniatures, stands and stuff. Um, we were talking about this earlier, though, weren't we? Which was like, again, it's like using that term war games, where you go, well, war games don't have to. I've played Squad Leader and many, many, many other war games which didn't have miniatures at all. And the rules definitely outweighed the, you know, the, even though there's, there's there's still an aesthetic, I think, in terms of tabletop games, there's an aesthetic of, like, um, of little stacks of counters. That are, you know, they have a, they have an appeal of their own. You know, or, or thinking back to like, like say the the um, Horus Heresy board game and the mm. uh, yeah. uh, Armageddon and Doom of the Elder. Again, they they had a, the an appeal, but but and and that's just increased. You know, I think. The aesthetic, the presentation of a game isn't just about having miniatures, it's the overall thing. Um, so, uh, but yeah, this is, sorry, this was, I've talked about this. I was going to, I had a very quick anecdote, which was back in the days of the old, it was literally called the Warhammer Forum. Um, and I, 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 when I was Warhammer Lawmaster, and I had a, we'll, we'll call it a conversation with a person about uh, some of the 
grey areas of, of Warhammer rules. And basically I said, um, uh, do you know what? I think I don't think you really want to play miniatures games. I think for the level of precision and kind of clarity that you need, you should play like uh, you should play board war games or board games or a card game because those things are much more concrete and set. They're just the vagaries of miniatures games are just you know are you a quarter of an inch in or not blah blah. blah. They're not for you. Uh, and you know that was it. And then it was a few years ago. I got an email from him. I may have even done a podcast with him. I can't remember exactly how it went off. And he said that was the best advice anyone had ever given. Him. <laughs> yeah, because he just realised he just was he was into the game. He wasn't into the miniatures. It was yeah. just that that's what his friends played and stuff. And he got into board gaming. He got into board, and he loved it. And he just realised. And actually, so it's like. So for me, it's like if you want a miniatures game, then the miniatures have to be luscious and amazing. And and what we aspire to having lovely painted armies on beautifully made terrain that's the aspiration we, we half the time we have you know a book for a hill and you know half a painted squad but the aspiration has to be <laughs> yeah. for that yeah. for that spectacle for a miniatures game not less a war game is, you know, is whatever yeah i agree about I, I, the oh, Farmageddon and horus heresy you know, like the stack the stack ones because they just are so simple and, and i i find it really difficult the the hardest thing about war games for me is measuring and like all of that and i find it really frustrating when when i do it and like you've missed your charge range and it's just like but this is so annoying <laughs> like I, I just find it annoying and and i i maybe i i watched like war games first but i played i think it was Hor i think it was battle for armageddon i think i put that was one of the very first war games that i played and i just really liked the mechanic of it and the simplicity and I didn't have to faff around with like moving models that always fell over. I'm not very good at moving models. <laughs> I mean, it was largely a lift and squad leader, but the actual games themselves are, I still think to this day, superb. And it's really interesting seeing when FFG did their re release of Horus Heresy, and it was their attempt to try and move into the miniature space for the same game. But they made two fatal flaws. One, they made the game much more faffy and much more difficult to play and less interesting in many respects because of this. And also the miniatures that they provided were exceedingly limited. So it didn't hit that beautiful, oh, look at this, I've set up, finally, the, it's all going to fall, there's the Emperor, oh, fucking yes! Um, it didn't have any of that because it was just a bunch of Titans and a bunch of basic troop models. And you're like, yeah, okay, that's fine. But it doesn't really feel like the end of the freaking galaxy. What, what, what? No, um, where the cards left all the imagination open and oddly was much more evocative than the miniatures in that case. Um, at least mm -hmm. so I found. If there's any particular favorite for the FFG version of um, Horus Heresy out there, then I apologize for stomping on your toys there. But it just didn't quite do it for me for all the box was freaking enormous. And I do love a big box. Because I'm a child. Um, we've only we've only got three minutes left, so I'll bring up. Oh, Killer holy heck, Already. Um, what mechanic did you love in theory but dislike during play? Um. Okay. Uh, so very quickly. So uh, talk about third edition 40k, and I did the third edition Blood Angels Codex. Um, and one of the things I wanted to get across was the fact that they were a, a little bit nutty and wanted to kind of close with the enemy. Sometimes they get slightly uh, slightly carried away with themselves. Um, and, uh, and so the original version of the rules I had that you tested for each squad and vehicle, whether they were devastators or, you know, tank or whatever else, and on, on a roll of a one, it's a bit like animosity for all squads, basically. On a roll of one, they had to move towards the enemy. Wow. And that was it. So they'd, they'd lose that. If they were devastators, they'd lose their chance to shoot. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but Jervis persuaded me that people tend to forget rules that aren't beneficial to them um and therefore and persuaded me that it should be so I, it came it ended up being essentially uh, if they rolled a one it became a bonus move um uh, but then of course that just made certain things faster and got into combat more and they were nasty mm -hmm. stuff. so i i would go back and use my original version is the short answer to that i think i think people always orcs and goblins players never forget animosity and their opponents definitely know it's there <laughs> it's like you don't know the details of it but you know have you rolled for animosity? did you roll for animosity did you roll for black rage did you roll for black rage would have been the same thing so i should have not listened to jervis for but about one the one piece of advice <laughs> that i probably should have ignored from jervis <laughs> <laughs> i like that, well, that 
brings us <laughs> you know, pretty much to the end of the stream. I'm just going to put that comment away it's flew and by. bring up Gav. Wow. Um, Told you. <laughs> Patreon, just to remind people, check out Gav's Patreon. And um, that's us for another Inside the Rookery. So thank you, Gav, uh, as always, for coming on and 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 answering uh, the patrons' questions, the questions in the chat, and our random questions that we threw at you as well. Um, thank you to our patrons for supporting us and continuing to make Inside the Rookery possible. Thank you to my fellow rooks, Andy and Mark. Until the next time, all the Can I just say drop is... in with a quick little thing yeah. before we stop? I'd just like to say that Gav is an absolutely extraordinary chap and has brought an immense amount of joy to many of us. So I would just like to say thanks for that. And for all of you out there who are watching just now, take a look at those words at the bottom of the screen. Think what they actually mean and do pay a little visit because Gav is awesome and he's helped us enjoy our lives so much. So why not go read more of his stuff? That's what I say. And I feel that that is worth just pushing harder. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tips that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And on that note, till the next time, good night and coco, coco. See you Bye. <laughs> Are you going to go?